lovelies to the Ultimate Dance Business Podcast. My name is Deborah Laws, the dance business expert. My passion is to help you turn your passion into profit while guiding you to work less and earn more. I'm super excited to share interviews with you that I know will inspire and motivate you in your schools, as well as my solo shows where I shall be sharing some great tips and strategies. So if you love the show, please do remember to review, subscribe and share it with your fellow dance boss friends. So let's get stuck into the business of dance. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining me, for all the lovely listeners and to the gorgeous Josephine Lankuba, who is all the way over in Australia. Jo, hi. Hi, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm excited. (laughs) Well, we are excited too, because I love it when we have guests that are from very different parts of the world. And I think a lot of my listeners are predominantly here in the UK and we're nosy. Like we love to know what dance schools are doing in, you know, in different places, how you guys do things differently. um, And also, you know, what you're up to in your business, because Um, you've got other things going on as well as running a school. So I'm excited for today's chat. Thank you. So Joe, tell me a little bit about yourself. So uh, I have been um, a studio owner for about 10 years. I started with a traditional dance studio and moved probably halfway through my studio ownership journey into a very niche style of studio ownership, which is now musical theatre. And I I suppose that was a, the really the beginning of the growth for me because once I niched right down, I started to have people coming to me for that very specific reason and that was because they knew we were the, you know, the place to be for musical theatre. Uh, before I even started a studio, you know, my journey began as a performer So I was an entertainer myself for many years, Uh, you know, well, working entertainer, which really means (laughs) waiting on tables for six months of the year. Uh, And uh, I also went into talent management. So I started working with promotional companies, managing artists, you know, for on set, uh, for theatre, for promotional work, you know, everything from suit character work to television appearances. Uh, And in the last two years, I've been a performing arts business coach, and I've also been helping studio owners in many different facets of studio ownership, but also specialising in that talent management space and how to create that in-house talent management service, because I do think that is something that's really untapped in our market. So we have some kind of similarities here in terms of kind of expanding outside of the, I don't want to say just running a dance school because there's nothing just about that, as we know. Um, But you obviously have an entrepreneurial spirit. You wanted to do something more than running your school. Like what was your driving factor behind going into more of a coaching industry and helping people with talent agencies? Well, it actually started in COVID and funnily enough, I think a lot of revelations happened during that period. Um, One of them was when a lot of studios were shutting down or really losing their business, which was quite a horrible event, uh, I was still receiving work through the agency. Because if you think about it from a performance point of view, yes, maybe live shows and stage productions had ceased, but advertising was still running. There was still stuff being presented to us on our screens and commercials were actually very much a part of, you know, the landscape during COVID. We were still being advertised to. So I still had students and artists working, but in a different capacity. And I was still receiving some income during that time from the agency. I mean, I was running my my studio online We went down to 40% uh, our usual capacity during COVID because not everyone wanted to learn online and that's just the way it went down. And I do recall one day I was sitting in my pyjamas as we did during COVID and to this day now. (laughs) Uh, And I was sitting in my pyjamas on my laptop working, doing some agency stuff and I was submitting one of my students for a role with Hugh Jackman. And I just remember thinking 
wow, you know, little old me is sitting here on my couch in my pajamas, submitting one of my students for a role next to Hugh Jackman. I'm assuming in the UK, you know who Hugh Jackman is. Absolutely. <laughs> and that was a big deal. Yeah. And that was a big deal. And I just thought, if I can do this, anyone can do this. It's actually not rocket science. And people just don't know about it. Now, not to say that everyone has to work with Hugh Jackman. Um, you know, since then, I've had people working in series with Nicole Kidman, with Sigourney Weaver, but also likewise in a McDonald's commercial or a Steggles chicken commercial, you know, like there's such a variety of work. And I just realized that there was an opportunity that studio owners were missing out on because having an in-house talent management service, I believe, and from what my, you know, the results of my clients, I know to be true is that it, you know, it increases your revenue it actually can increase your student retention. It's such a great student retention strategy. Uh, And a lot of those people did come back that were with the agency after COVID as well. We retained a lot of those students. Uh, But it's also great for industry credibility. And it was just such a light bulb moment during that time. And that's when I started developing the course Talent Manager Bootcamp because I wanted other studio owners to know what I knew to be true. It's something I'd always done since the day I opened my doors you know, 10 years ago, I've always had a talent management service in-house because I, that's my world and I understood it. So it just made sense to teach others to do the same. Mm, yeah. And I think that's an incredible kind of add on to what you provide for your students. You mentioned, you know, the retention value in that um, because, of course, uh, you know, Uh, we all know as principals and studio owners that a lot of people come to us because their darling is going to be the next, you know, the next, whatever, the big star. Um, So to be able to show that, you know, for those that are the right fit, you know, there are opportunities that parents might be looking for right from the get go, um, but also for them to be able to grow into, because do you do anything for your students um, like any additional program or an associate type program where they work more closely with you so that they can get more work? Or do you just literally have the kids on your books? We have workshops and development workshops that they So that's another part of the revenue stream system because it's not just about the direct income from the agency, but it's also the indirect. So people that are part of the agency, um, even though we don't make it compulsory to do additional workshops like how to film a great self-tape, audition technique, et cetera, et cetera, they're more likely to buy those additional add-ons. And so for that reason, um, there is also an indirect income that comes from it that is actually charged through the studio, which is really, really fantastic. So uh, I do have clients that do incorporate it into programming. I also have clients that um, create their own professional performance companies. So the difference being, you know, when you have a traditional talent agency, you represent your your artists in film, television, theatre, commercial, musical theatre, etc. But when you have a professional performance company, you're creating the work and you're selling it to market, right? You know, you're a pantomime or whatever. Um, last year, I wrote my own original musical theatre show. And and that was really successful. It was for the children's market. And in one week, we made $30,000 worth of sales, Australian dollars. And, you know, that's a good week. And that was all from having a professional performance company in-house. So, yeah, I think that you can absolutely add it to the programming. I know that some of my clients, and and we work through that, do have it, especially with their senior streams. So with their senior students or those juniors or tweens, they they will incorporate some, some elements to that as well, where they have a progressive programming system where they can move into agency and perform professionally and get paid for it, which is really, really cool. Because when kids age out, as they do, you can retain them in a different way. So that's the other part. I think it's interesting because student retention doesn't just have to be about keeping them in the classroom. You're retaining them as a client, whichever way, shape or form that is. And so, for example, aging out, like I said, of your programming, they may stay with you in the agency. And that's a really cool part of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds sounds absolutely fantastic. And 
So if you were, I mean, obviously you do a whole training on this. You have a boot camp where you teach people to do this. Um, but do you have some general criteria that you think dance school principals really need to be able to fulfill in order for them to be able to become a talent agency? So I, and this will, this is the controversial part because a lot of agencies will not like me very much (laughs) because there is an elite sort of attitude when it comes to the industry. We know the golden gates that no one's allowed through or the glass ceiling that we're not allowed to to crack. Um, So, you know, I do think that it can be highly inclusive and I believe that the criteria really, like there's no minimum amount of students you need to have. You can be a boutique agency that has five represented artists or you can be a bulk agency with 500. So there's none of that going on. I think there are limitations in certain places. For example, capital cities will have the commercial work, okay, Regional country towns won't, but that doesn't mean they can't operate a, like a you know an in-house talent management service. It just means it's going to look different, and that's something that we do cover because I think that's an imp- it's important to set your expectations and not you know be dishonest about what the possibilities are. We know when it comes to commercial and advertising that they film they are filming in capital cities. That's that's the truth. But when it comes to television, you know, film roles, they are usually national call-outs. Now, especially post-COVID, everything is self-tape, first audition. It used to be you had to go into the the casting director's office, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to do that anymore. A lot of it's self-tape, so it doesn't matter where you are. And by the time you get a call back or a recall or whatever, you know, you're on board. So there's there is an opportunity there. When it comes to professional performance companies, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. You know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. You can sell to your local market or externally. So that's how I sort of look at it, um, that anyone can do it. It just will look different depending where you're located, you know. So that's probably the key element there. Yeah. And as you said, um, you know, managing those expectations, I'm sure you do this as part of your onboarding onto your course, because, you know, if you really are hundreds and hundreds of miles, you know, away from any main recording studio or locations where these things happen, um, the the chances are that you're not going to get an awful lot of work for your students. And of course, you need the students with the parents with the right commitment level too, don't you? So it's, um, it's, yeah, managing that. But um, for those, schools that you know are in the right kind of locations or it can work for them um you know I just I just love this idea and one of the things that kind of just would be the instant thing that popped up in my head would be oh gosh you know I'm not sure whether I would know how to cope with all the legal side of things like the legalities of contracts and working with is that something that you teach as well on your course yeah so in Australia I'm able to provide more support in relation to the contract templates, but I will not provide that to my international friends. That is something they have to do locally. But look, you know, you go to a solicitor like you would an employment contract and you get something drawn up. And it's, again, it's not rocket science, but you definitely need to get the right support. So we talk about that. Uh, We also talk about tapping into the, the legislation when it comes to hiring children you can't just hire children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so even just people learning about that, because there's a lot of studios that are actually running professional performance companies. And I do that in inverted commas that are not doing it well or are not actually in line with what their what their local requirements are. So even just flagging that, hey, you should look into that is a really important factor. I mean, I know of someone. I'll never say who, that hired some children to do a music video unpaid and then they had them on set for something crazy like eight hours and just gave them lollipops, no catering, no like it's ridiculous, you know. And so just knowing that that's not okay, that you can't like, for example, there are certain age brackets in Australia anyway and you might say, okay, well, this age group can only stay on set for four hours and then they have to have a break. Just knowing that. 
So that's the sort of stuff that we talk about, knowing, finding out who your local children's employment officer is and just starting a conversation, you know, get the facts and do it properly. Uh, that's it. But that is one of the reasons why when I did tour my musical theatre show last year, I actually purposely chose young adults because we were doing interstate travel and I didn't want to I didn't want to deal with the interstate travel with minors. But, you know, there's lots of ways to work around it. Um, but, yeah, that is something to consider. But when it comes to television and all that jazz, these sorts of things are covered by the employment companies. I mean, you're talking about big companies, you're talking about, you know, McDonald's, you're talking about KFC, uh, you know, telecommunication companies, energy companies. They've got, they've got it all down pat and it's more just that they're presenting you with the agreement and you have to sign, you know. So... Um, in that sense, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, sure. Um, I'd love to dive a little bit, Joe, now into, you know, running a dance school in Australia, mm -hmm. because as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, you know, we're all very inquisitive and nosy about how things are done in different places in the world. And I was fortunate enough to um, get to know quite a lot of Aussie dance school owners and Americans as well. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things that really struck me as being different um, was some of the business mentality. Now, it might be because I was mixing with other people that were also, you know, in a program to learn. Um, but what would you say about dance school owners in Australia in terms of wanting to run a business rather than a passion project? Like, uh, are people quite good? Are they, do they seek out ways of which to learn to be better at business? Or um, is it similar to how it here, is here in the UK, which is in my opinion, and I apologize if I offend anybody now, um, it's kind of a get up and wing it most days kind of thing goes on here in the UK. Yeah. I love this question. And I think you're absolutely right in the sense of um, Australians, more in the last couple of years especially, are gearing towards moving away from being a hobbyist studio to being a professional business. And so viewing it differently, and I think this is one of the key, and I love that we're talking about this because this is one of the key things that I, you know, share with my, my, you know, coaching clients and whatnot, that we need to shift the focus because, yes, of course you can be passionate and love what you do and be an artist and be creative and all the things, right, that comes with having a performing arts business, but it is a business. And I think when you work for too long without pay or without profitability, that it actually isn't fun anymore and the, the passion is literally sucked out of you. Now, this wasn't always the case. Uh, I think Australians have shifted in the last couple of years, probably catching up to that American market. And there is a lot of American influence here as well. So because we're a smaller market, you know, we're a smaller marketplace than you would be in Europe, UK, the USA. So we do tend to get some international influences and and that conversation is really starting to shift. But I will say that there's still too many uh, studio owners in Australia. Even though that conversation is shifting, there are too many in Australia that are still not grasping that. And I think that's coming through more from the people that have had their studios for a really, really long time. So we're probably seeing the new up-and-comers, the new generation of studio owners really on board. They're buying all the workshops, <laughs> you know, they're like keen as mustard. They're at the conferences. And that's not to say that more mature studio owners are not. It's just we're like I was at a conference um, a few months ago in Australia and it was massive. And I can, I can tell you now, most of the people there, I reckon, had to have been under 40, I reckon 80% of the audience. And so, you know, it's just, it's just knowing that the landscape of business has changed and the way we operate in a performing arts space has changed, especially post COVID. And I think people need to, to start, um, if they want to survive or thrive rather, they do need to be open to education. And it doesn't have to be in the way of coaching. Like, of course, I think there's a lot of value in one-on-one -on -one coaching or group coaching sessions. It's what I do. It's what you do. But even just listening to podcasts like this, getting a book, you know, there's so many different ways to learn. And so I think that is crucial in today's market. It's, it's, it's shifting and changing. I mean, I've met studio owners that are still 
using pen to paper for receipts. You know, yeah. it, it needs to change. So I thought I would just share with you guys today the um, planners that I have produced for dance school owners because these are flying out of Amazon like hotcakes. And if you don't have yours yet, then all you have to do is pop to Amazon and type into the search Deborah Laws and all three books will come up. So the ultimate dance business planner I designed for you so that you had a little bit of a Deborah on your desktop. (laughs) The planners are full of business training, tips, motivational quotes, Uh, Things to do at the start of the month, things to do at the end of the month, ways in which you can plan out your marketing and your retention, and they are selling all over the world. So go to Amazon, grab your number one best-selling Ultimate Dance Business Planner and enjoy mapping out the growth for your studio. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, I think, I mean, this is one of the things I love to do is I love to scoop up and and give those older studio owners, you know, mm. a, a real, a real encouragement and a look, you know, it's, if you, if you start working with a, a coach, a business coach, it's not because you're not great. It's not because you don't know what you're doing. It's because we want you to survive all these new youngsters coming through that, are learning they are going out and and um have a bit more of a business mindset and it's scary you know if you're mm-hmm. you know 50 plus and you've had your school for many years and there's everything is constantly changing in terms of how you attract new students you know social media that's a really scary automation place. this funnel that <laughs> absolutely technology like it's it's scary and i think people can do one or two things You know, they either kind of go, I'm going to bury my head and keep going with the same strategies and tactics I've always done because it's always worked for me in the past. Right. Or they can say, "Okay, I'm going to get in there. I'm going to get stuck in. I'm going to have an open mindset in terms of learning some new things um, because I, I'm this I've got some life left in me like I'm not ready to hang up yeah. my shoes I'm not ready to sell totally. my school I love what I'm doing I love my kids I've built a lovely business but in order for it to survive and it's not even that we're trying to get these um more mature seasoned dance school owners we're not even trying to necessarily help them build huge empires they may not be looking for that right now but just to survive and not lose their students when the new latest um you know beautiful yeah. young thing starts up down the road Um, you know that's important and to know that they can go to someone or go to a group of people that will um, help them in that respect and not make it scary like that's one of the things I just I love I love to scoop up all generations but particularly I suppose because I'm getting old myself (laughs) some of the old this this is the thing like you said I mean you know you're hitting the nail on the head there I think it's really important to support everyone and these you know mature seasoned studio owners they've got a legacy you know they've been some of these people have been running them for 30 40 years and that is so powerful the thing is it's all in the messaging isn't it you know so you know how can we compete with the newcomer down the road because you've got a legacy and that is so powerful but it's all in the messaging and making sure that that messaging is coming through in a way that the modern audience can absorb it Social yeah. media is a big one. You know, getting a grasp on having that frequency, consistency, it's hard, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. But I can understand from that perspective. I mean, look, I pick up new technology here and there too, and I just think, oh, God, here's another. Is this another app <laughs> that I have to learn? Is this another software program? So it can be overwhelming. I mean, even chat GPT, I remember I had a post-it note on my computer for three to four months going, must check out ChatGPT. And then once I actually logged in, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I waited three to four months to log into ChatGPT. Like it's so easy to use. So just it's just that mind block sometimes of getting over that initial challenge of getting started. But once you get there and, you know, like anything, you you learn new things and you get used to it, right? So, yeah, for sure, having that more inclusive aspect when it comes to the different types of people that run studio businesses. 
Mm, yeah, absolutely. So we have got you. We've got you guys. <laughs> if you think that you are, you know, starting to get left behind, then reach out, find yourself a business mentor, <laughs> find somebody that will help and support you through, you know, learning new things. And um, whether it's like Joe said, whether it's automation, whether it's a, the latest app, whether it's, you know, taking your payments to, by direct, whatever it is, if it's tech based or social media based or digital based, and you kind of feel like, oh, I'm drowning in all this new stuff please ask for help because that's what we're here for that's what just what yes. and I are here to do it's our passion um direct debit's a big one i love that i I, yeah. I rave about direct debit i mean when i moved over to direct debit a few years ago oh my goodness game changer like, what an improvement to cash flow and just everything about it was just phenomenal we went from over 50 percent of our students paying late. And when I say paying late, anything from one day to one month or three months, you know, sometimes. I've seen in Facebook groups, some studio owners are talking about having students that haven't paid them for six months. It's it's crazy, right? We went from over 50% of our students paying late to like literally two to 3% now with bounce, bounce backs. And that's mega. That's all from, um, from that as well. Yeah, I like yeah. to think a bit of industry credibility as well when you run an in-house talent management service. You know, you're a bit of a dream maker, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that I think that there's an element of that because you know when people have like high level respect for what you do, you know, people want to make sure that they're looking after you as well. I've had some horror stories with clients in relation to late payments. Everything from someone at my front desk who only owed me. This was years ago before I was, you know, a tough girl. Not not that I'm a tough girl, but I was assertive, you know, and I stood up for myself and I had, and I have boundaries now that I don't allow to be crossed. But back then I didn't when I first started and I'll never forget at reception, I had this woman say to me, oh, Jo, I'm so sorry. I can't pay you today um, because I've just bought myself a new Mustang. And she showed me her Mustang out the front. Mustang, a car, it's very expensive <laughs> And I've just come back from Bali. So I'm just broke and I can't afford to pay you. That was when I knew <laughs> something had to change. So, yeah, just it, there's been some um, unbelievable stories I've, I've seen um, in the studio for sure. And I'm sure everyone listening has had those moments as well. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's where we all share common ground. Um, <laughs> and so actually, that's a lovely segue on to asking you, um, just because it's so lovely to share other experiences. And as I said earlier, especially with somebody, you know, in another in another country, um, worst moment or period running a dance school, uh, dance school since you've been running one and best memory or period of time the worst one came to mind straight away uh, <laughs> I do remember when I started expanding to multiple locations I probably went a bit too quick so I had a thought that the more the merrier right and I have four studio locations now but I went up to eight at one stage and then you look I probably could have uh, done more to support the team on site. But what ended up happening was that people were expecting way too much from me. And one of the studio sites was quite far from my home, like a couple of hours. So I wasn't able to go in as much, but it was never my intention to be in there. Of course, I can't be in eight studios at once. So I trained my team, but I was new to this multiple location scenario. And I had a mum it was like an episode of Dance Mums, the American version. And, <laughs> and I had a mum come backstage and literally yell at me in the, like on show day and say, where have you been? Where have you been? And really, I mean, to the point where they threatened me, they were threatened to abuse me. It was like literally an episode from Dance Mums. And, you know, and you haven't been there to support. And I just thought, whoa, 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 this is crazy, right? Um, that was probably the worst moment because I went, I stood my ground and I tried to be, you know, firm and assertive and all, but I ended up backstage in a melting pot of tears, feeling like a complete and utter failure, um, that I hadn't done enough or whatever. But really the expectations of me were too high. And that's because I didn't communicate my expect what was going to happen. Like I tried to pretend 
maybe, I think a little bit. I just had my ch- child as well, but I tried to pretend potentially that maybe I was going to be at the same touch point as I was in my first studio business, but that wasn't the case. It was never going to happen. Yeah. It was never going to happen. And I learned that. So that was a hard lesson to learn, but I learned it. And I ended up having like parents boycott the show and walk, do all storm out. And it was, it was literally an episode of Dance Moms. It was horrific. And that's never happened since. We've got systems in place, expectations laid, communication elevated, all sorts of things. That was the worst scenario. I think the best, honestly, there's a couple, but I mean, some of the things, I'll, I'll just say two quick ones. One of them was recently, like I said, I've got students that age out of our programs. And one of our beautiful students that we had since 12, who's now 19, recently aged out. And she's now performing professionally musical theatre shows um, in Sydney and through our agency. And she was in the recent, you know, Matilda's World Cup, um, soccer World Cup, um, or football rather, football World Cup uh, commercial. And just seeing that's really beautiful and knowing that you're a part of that professional story. But secondly, my little boy's in the background, but anyway, that's okay. But secondly, um, actually, one of the worst things that happened, but something good came out of it was during COVID, we produced the world's first um, self-taped like self musical movie filmed by and starring kids. So we initially were meant to put Peter Pan on stage and it ended up being Peter Pan Breaks the Internet. Now that sounds horrific, I'm sure, to many people, but I was really proud of the team and it was a moment where I knew that there was so much that was possible um, and it was my virtual awakening, to be honest. And that's when I started moving into coaching, started recognizing the power of talent management, started recognizing the power of virtual private lessons. So we still operate virtual private lessons in our studio today. We have what we call our singing hub, which is our virtual studio. We call it our fifth location. And we've got so many students that are a part of that. Um, which is a beautiful upsell and and actually really low cost to run. And I know a lot of people wouldn't be interested in that, but honestly, it's it's such a great upsell. It doesn't require space. So that was a great thing that came out of it all. Um, But yeah, we've had some really beautiful moments, to be honest, Mm. but that's a couple of them. That's so fascinating that you've got, um, you've still got an online um, hub going because obviously so many people, um, you know, closed their Zoom account, walked away, shut their laptops and were like, never, never going back there. But you're utilizing the fact that there are still people that need and want that virtual um, training. So, you know, it's again, great that that's another another way of generating income. Yes. For you. And I will say, and I love and I love this because people will, I understand it. No one wants to look at Zoom again. I totally get it. But honestly, it's been great because it's a self-managed portal. So what we do is we have um, people that want the private lessons, the teachers that are interested in providing these private lessons online, they upload their, their schedules into our Calendly schedule. They each have a login and the client literally pays a monthly flat rate pro rata fee for, and they get one lesson a week and they just log into the calendar, pick their coach click, pick their time, click, and it's all self-managed. So it's really low cost to run. It's it's minimal admin for us as a business. Our coaches get extra work and we get extra sales. So I don't know, I'm actually all for it. Obviously, group classes are still challenging, but privates, mm. it can work. Yeah, Especially for singing fantastic. and drama, some dance, like I probably wouldn't want to do acro over Zoom. <laughs> you know, but there are there are places where it works. Yes. Um, yeah. So that's been a beautiful upsell for us. Yeah, amazing. That sounds like a fantastic idea. I love it. Um, mm. And in terms of um, pain points, I'd love to just touch very briefly on whether yours are the same as ours all the way over mm-hmm. here. So what would you say when you have clients that come to you or even just yourself as a dance school owner, if you mm-hmm. had to think of like the one biggest pain point the biggest challenge running your school what would that be oh goodness there's a few that come to me (laughs) look one pain point is I think people really struggle with retaining the little ones when they're moving from program to program so for example we're competing not just with other dance studios we're competing with netball swimming 
Uh, so that can be a pain point. I think a lot of people at the moment are blaming the reduction in numbers due to inflation, costs are rising. So that's a fear that's happening. I think, look, if the world can buy a Taylor Swift ticket and prioritise that, then the world can pay for dance. <laughs> you know, so it's about shifting that as well. Uh, I think the pain points would be pretty much global. You know, everything from how we retain our students, how do we keep them engaged, um, how do we attract new students, especially through social media and what people would perceive as a really flooded market. Uh, you know what I mean? Oh, gosh, there's so many schools now online, but you've got to be in it, right? I do think that one of the tools that I, I use, uh, which is probably differentiates between a lot of studios is the power of the mailing list. I actually don't think enough studio owners utilise building a mailing list and a following through email. I hate to rely, like social media is a big part of our process. We do paid marketing for at seasonally. So because we do show titles, like for example, Frozen, Junior or Aladdin, we will do robust three-month intensive paid campaigns and then rest for three months and then robust again for the second half of the year. Um, but I don't like to just rely on social media. We are constantly list building like other businesses do, but not enough performing arts businesses think about the email list. And I'm not talking about active clients. I'm talking about community, people, you know, building that mailing list. So we still do that style of marketing too, which has helped. Mm. But yeah, look, same, same. I'm sure as yourself, like what's the biggest pain point that you're seeing across your market at the moment? Oh, definitely the same, Re you know, retaining the students that they've mm. got. I think the, you know, one in, one out um, is massive. You know, everyone's working really hard to get students in the door and then, oh, another email drops in to say, my little one's not coming back next, you know, yeah. next term. But the thing that I... I would love to just pick up on this point because it's just a quick tip for people. Um, so many people say to me, oh, I've lost 10, you know, I gained 12 and I've lost, but I've lost 10. So it kind of is not that much growth. Um, but the ones I've lost are all genuine reasons. Like there's nothing I could have done about them. And I, and I kind of say, okay, well, let's just dive into those 10 because when you mm -hmm. say there's nothing you could have done, did they move to Australia? That's not, normally the first thing that I say. <laughs> well, no, it's just that one, you know, one has decided that she wants to do football instead and another one has decided, you know, that she wants to do something else. And I say, yeah, but they're choosing to leave dance, to go and do football. That is something that's in your control because without being harsh, you know, if they love dance that much, they wouldn't be choosing now for another to go and try another activity. So, you know, unless somebody is physically moving away or, you know, a parent has lost a job and, and they're having to pull the purse strings in. A lot of the reasons when people say, oh, I couldn't really have done anything about them. They're all genuine reasons. There's still things in there. There's still things that we need to look at ourselves as to why people are leaving. Yeah. There's very few people that actually leave for reasons completely out of our control. I, I normally say between four and 5% of people leave are leaving literally because they have no choice. The others yeah. is because we've somehow lost them along the way. Um, but anyway, I could go on to talk about retention all day, and I'm sure you could too. <laughs> I'm sure you Look, could as well. The truth is that, that that's abs you're absolutely right, and that's why I use the Taylor Swift example. If people can prioritise buying a Taylor Swift ticket, why aren't they doing dance? And, mm -hmm. You know, because they were expensive tickets, you know, and everyone got one <laughs> that could, right? <laughs> yeah. but, but she's got a fandom people are obsessed with her for a reason, right? And it's about how do we get people obsessed with us? Yes. And it's creating the fandom, you know, that rock star brand. And so I'm really big on that. I believe there are ways to to build a rock star brand. And I think that people, they come for the ballet or they come for the teacher or whatever, but they stay for the community. And so it's about building a community that is so fierce that people it's, it's like FOMO, the fear of missing out. If they were to leave, you know, one simple exercise that I do is I tell my clients is, you know, hey, why don't you just tell them what's on for the year? Create a PDF, what's on? So they know, oh, we've got a Halloween party in October. We've got this, we've got that. So that they feel like they've got something to look forward to. Oh, we can't leave this month because next month is the party or we can't leave this month because in two months you've got a competition or, you know, 
just communicating the schedule. Such yeah. a simple exercise. Yeah, 100%. And that's one thing you can do. Yeah, but of course, dance school owners, that means that you actually have to create and be organized in your planning yeah. to have the schedule in the first place. <laughs> yeah, planning. You can't you can't um you can't grow something without plan. I truly believe that. I think you can have luck and you can fluke it for a while, but there comes a point where that 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 sweetness stops. Yeah. I mean, even the coaching space, you know, um, a lot of people boomed in COVID because everyone was online. And then after it, some coaches lost their entire business. You know, you got to keep evolving. You got to keep changing. And that requires a bit of discipline. But we teach discipline in the classroom. We apply discipline to the art. If we could see business as the art form and and discipline to that how powerful would that be so i i can be disciplined i can also have days where i want to lie in bed like all of us yeah but i love that, I love that actually joe and i think that's a really great place to start wrapping up you know if you can have discipline mm -hmm. in your classes and teach your kids to be disciplined then you need to, to transfer those skills into being disciplined with your marketing disciplined with writing your newsletters because you know these these are all the structural foundations that you need in order to grow a great yeah. school and we don't say to the kids hey let's just spend the whole lesson having fun doing you know fuates and 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 playing you know mind games and like you got to do the work and rock up and wing it let's just wing it guys let's just wing it and by the end of the year you'll be on stage and and, and performing just wing it <laughs> yeah know? exactly we do and, that, that, do we? and that goes back to what i said right at the beginning is you know being professional wingers which is not what what we want people <laughs> to do that are trying to earn a living um joe i love to finish my um interviews with some quick fire silly questions um oh they they require you to just kind of say whatever comes to mind first. So are you good for this? Let's do it. Okay. All right. So a nice, easy one to start with. Favorite ice cream? Chocolate. Chocolate. Uh, favorite business book? Uh, Million Dollar Micro Business from Tina Tower. Lovely. We'll all go and look that one up. If you could go back in history and spend 15 minutes with anybody, who might that be? Can they still be alive? No, because that's <laughs> my next did. question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's really, really hard. Um, I don't know. Maybe someone that's quite a – it's probably going to be an artist like Michael Jackson or someone that's quite prolific in the, in the music industry. Okay, fabulous. Yeah, go with that. I'm, lock it in, Eddie. <laughs> and somebody that is still alive that you'd like to spend 15 minutes with. Oh, my God. Oprah. Mm, she's mine. I want to meet Oprah so bad. Yeah, yeah. she's mine. Um, and actually, some people, because obviously, you know, here in the UK, um, you know, people are hoping that I'm going to say somebody profound in the UK, but I just, um, I think she's an incredible incredible force that is um has way more intention for good in the world than people credit her for i think in the uk people just remember her as being this you know chat show host you know why would why is that so important right. but i think she's phenomenal absolutely phenomenal so i'm with phenomenal. you with definitely with you with that one um and i would love to ask you and i'm stealing this from we have a guy in the uk i don't know if you've heard of him he's called stephen bartlett and he's got a podcast called diary of a ceo have you heard of this guy I've heard of, but not listened to the podcast, if I'm honest, but now I'm going to, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Stephen Bartlett is um, uh, a UK entrepreneur who's literally made millions, still very young, um, and he's on our Dragon's Den. Do you have Dragon's Den over in Australia? Yes, and I love, we call it Shark Tank, the Australian version, okay. but um, I have watched the UK version, Dragon's Den. I think I've binge watched it. Yes, I love oh, it. Okay, and well, he's one of the the more recent dragons, yes. but he's got a fab podcast called Diary, Diary of a CEO, and he always asks his guests at the very end to come up with a question for the next guest that I interview. And I haven't done this before. But I listened to his podcast driving back from a big event at the weekend and I thought, I'm going to start doing this. So I don't have a question for you that the previous guest has asked because you're the first one. <laughs> but if I've you could one. pass on a question, what's the question going to be? 
How do you define success? What does success mean to you? How do you define success? And so I'm going to ask you your own question, Jo. Mm -hmm. For me, it's really about freedom. It's waking up each day knowing that I have the freedom to choose and being able to just be happy within that space, you know, like I think I think it is it sounds privileged, but but that is to me success. It is being able to choose my what I do with my time, to choose what I do with my money, to choose how I, you know, connect with my family. And so just having the freedom of choice, that is success. And that's an that's still I'm still working on it, you know. It's there are days where I feel really successful. I feel like I've achieved so much, and I, I'm like, wow, I've done it. And you know, I, I've got the freedom to to take three weeks off of my business and know that the the burning's not it, the the building's not going to burn down. That's success to me, knowing that I can step away, and the wheels keep turning. And when I come back, everything's okay. You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that, and that's part of my I, success. And I love that question. And I'm definitely going to ask the next guest that question because it's also intriguing because everybody's idea of success is different. So mm. uh, thank you so much for sharing your idea. We'll pass that question on. Um, you and I, I think, need to link arms and find a way to get to Oprah, maybe with both of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll be more yes, successful. Exactly. I would love to say as well to everyone listening, um, I I love Instagram. It's my place to play. So if you want to follow me, check it out at Josephine Lane Cuba. But you can find me on Instagram and Facebook. But yeah, I'm very, I'm very creative on Instagram. Let's just say that. And I'm not sure if you've seen some of my stuff. <laughs> no, but I'm gonna yeah, go and but, look yeah, now um, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go check it out. It's a lot of fun. But um, yeah, guys, I, I'd love you to yeah, follow, follow my journey on Instagram. And if you have any questions about anything I do, send me a DM. I'm so up for a conversation. So yeah, thank you so much. I've really appreciated being on the show. Absolutely. And we will put all the links um, that you sent across yeah. in the show notes so people can come and find you as well. Um, and um, thank you so much for coming and chatting to me today. Um, and I wish you all the luck with creating your freedom and your success. Um, Joe, thank you. And we'll speak again soon. Thank you so much. So I wanted to quickly tell you a little bit about Showtime Circus. This is run by my good friend, Jess, who has created an incredible circus bolt-on franchise for your dance school. Because aerial and circus performance skills has become a really desirable skill set for choreographers and casting directors. And so Showtime Circus offers the opportunity to buy a franchise package which will give you all of your necessary equipment, training from experienced staff, syllabus plans, ongoing support, and business support to launch your new franchise. It will really energize your school with increased revenue streams, new student opportunities, and of course, bring all the fun of the circus to your school. So do go and visit showtimecircus.co.uk to find out what the new buzz is around circus skills.